Hello, my name is Guillermo Gallego, and in this video, we will take a look in detail at one of the papers that is doing image reconstruction and at the same time estimation the camera motion. Um, yeah, let's go for it. So, this is interesting because it's doing image reconstruction from events in case of a purely rotating event camera. And in this case, we could assume that the motion is known. Right? If we want to focus on image reconstruction, let's assume that we know the motion of the camera. And for reference, this is a, the, the paper is by the group at Imperial College, I mean, appeared in Britain Machine Vision Conference in 2014. So recall that uh, events are generated any time that a single pixel, uh, this is the pixel circuit, it uh, detects that light, arriving at the photoreceptor and passing through this change, it changed by more than a predefined step C, right? So the brightness is, uh, and that's represented also in this image, C is the step that basically says how, how we sample the range. Um, and then light, which is the black line here, is converted into this set of asynchronous events represented as uh, these spikes, blue and red, on and off events. Well, the idea of image reconstruction is that, in principle, we could uh, obtain absolute intensity if we could uh, integrate somehow these changes to get back the, the original signal, which is not possible, but some approximation of it. And there are some early works about this. Um, on uh, 2011 by a group in, in, at the Institute of Neuroinformatics in Zurich. And also this is from, from the paper that now we are going to take a look to the group at Imperial College in Weimar. So what we want is the following, is given the events and the camera motion, uh, here in this case we assume that we have a, a camera that is purely rotating, we would like to recover the absolute brightness. And that's what it's represented in this video. As the camera goes and we kind of know, for example, the motion, um, then the events are not shown in the video, but basically we want to obtain a panoramic image like this one reconstructed from, from the events. And well, it's not only that we will be able to get an image, it's also that because the the events are high dynamic range, then the reconstructed images that will also be high dynamic range. They in inherit those properties. Here we see how the image is built from, from scratch, from a zero, so like grayscale value. And on, on the right for comparison is the output of a, of a standard camera with a lower dynamic range. So given the events and the camera motion, we would like to recover absolute brightness. Is this actually possible? How is it possible? Well, the intuitive explanation is as follows, right? We have an event camera that naturally responds to edges. And if we know the camera motion, then we can relate these edges that are on happening on the image plane. We can put them on world coordinates into this mosaic or map. And that can, we will get an edge map. Uh, in these world coordinates. And then the idea is that uh, we just integrate this edge map to obtain uh, uh, absolute intensity. So there are two steps in the method. The first one is that from the events and the camera motion, we will try to get this uh, map of edges. So this image gradient map, both magnitude and direction of the edge. And then in a second step, we will use something called the Poisson integration or solve Poisson's equation to um, recover uh, absolute intensity from this uh, image gradient. Basically, it's doing like a 2D integration. Okay, let's go into the details of each step. Step one is to compute the gradient map. So imagine we have the following situation. We are representing here the, the big square is the, the reference, it's a map or the reference frame. And then the smaller square is the, the current field of view of the camera as it's moving. Um, okay, so we know that an event is generated due to there is a brightness change of size C at a pixel. In this case, we are looking at this red pixel 
on the image plane that has coordinates u and v. So in this case, u are is the column index and v is the row index, as usual, x and y. And when the cam while the camera is moving, the intensity of this pixel is changing, so we detect an event. Now this is an equation that it's on the image plane, but we would like to refer this equation to uh, instead of things that happen in coordinates UV, we'd like to have them in coordinates X and Y, which are coordinates of uh, the brightness map. Um, basically, what the equation would say is that at time t, um, the pixel of the camera is here, but at some time in the past, this same pixel with coordinate U and V, it happened to be at some other position. Right, so basically we will say that the, the map, the intensity that we see on the map is the same intensity that is seen or sensed at the image plane. That's the idea. So this LT will correspond to the intensity of the map at the point PM of T, so where the pixel uh, at time T, what's the corresponding point on the map? at that time and the brightness that happened at the last event so the, this at t minus delta t well this corresponds to some point on the map and then we read out the intensity which that's basically what this equation how it transfers we are converting the equation from the image plane into um, the map frame so the mosaic Next thing what we do is that we use Taylor's first order approximation and well we have here um, a difference of intensities or brightness on the map and we could say well we approximate this by uh, using Taylor so it's the gradient of m at the current at point pm and then dot product with <coughs> a displacement that in this case is um, delta delta p right so the in increment the displacement in p which we we approximate and we say that it's a velocity times uh, the interval delta t so this equation here is a linearized version of the above just using first order taylor approximation on on the left hand side Okay, uh, let's keep moving. And then so we've seen that we have the, we arrived in the previous step at this linearized equation because uh, we have used Taylor's approximation. And this same equation is here on the top right, basically saying that an event is generated if, and now we say what's the condition in terms of the map. Well, the condition in terms of the map is in the linearized case that um, there was a gradient um, that was moving with velocity t during time delta t, and then this created a brightness change of size c, so the amount was c. So the edge moved so much that um, it caused a brightness change of, of this amount. And it has a similar interpretation as on the image plane, right? It, because it's uh, this contrast, it's proportional to the dot product between the brightness gradient, uh, g, and the motion flow, uh, which is the velocity v on the, on, the, on the map point. We have extreme cases. What happens if uh, these two vectors, the gradient and the, the motion flow v are perpendicular well if they are perpendicular then this delta m in principle is zero which it cannot be z so well basically it means that no event is generated and then if g and v are parallel um, well the in brightness increase or brightness decrease is non-zero and basically we arrive and saying that this is approximately c and uh, because they are parallel, there is no way to make this uh, increase faster. Basically, events are triggered in the fastest, which means that in, in minimum time. It's not so important. Uh, what is important is to remember the relationship between uh, 
the brightness uh, increment, the brightness gradient, and the motion. So next thing that we do is that we take uh, into account this equation to design an extended Kalman filter. And we use the equation as uh, the measurement equation. So in this equation, if we know the camera motion, then we also know the apparent motion. So B is known, and delta T is known, and the contrast threshold, we can set a value. So it's also known. The only unknown is G. Uh, and it is constant, actually, because we are looking at a single point on the map. So let's try to use the Kalman filter the extent to estimate this uh, constant vector. And for that, we will use one Kalman, extended Kalman filter per map point. It might sound a bit expensive, that, but that's what it is. And because it's a constant, what we want to estimate, basically the state equation is that, well, the, the, the current state is equal to the previous state. And then the observation equation we will derive from, from the above equation. Right? So basically what we will do is that we move delta t to the other side and c to the other one. So we'll move things around and we come up with this uh, observation equation or the measurement model where g is a known, v is known, c is known. And then we measure actually one over delta t. So the, we use the event rate uh, at the map point pm as the observation. This is kind of a standard way to say it in the terms of Kalman filters. And these are then the filter equations. So how we iterate through through the measurements. So we receive or we compute the event rate at that point, and then we will compare it with the model uh, h from the current state g. So we use the current state g, the motion, and the contrast threshold to compute this h. We compare it to the measured value, and that gives us what is called the innovation. Then the innovation covariance is this one. It comes from using the measurement matrix, which is the Jacobian of the measurement uh, equation. Basically, because it's linear in G, the measurement matrix is the, is just the vector divided by C without G. The derivative is very easy to compute. And RK is the covariance of the measurement C, set K. This is a parameter that we, we can set we can tune. So that's the innovation, the innovation covariance, and then the Kalman gain has this expression. So PK is the, uh, K minus one is the covariance at the previous time. H we have seen is the measurement matrix, and this is the inverse of the innovation covariance. We compute the Kalman gain that will be multiplied by the innovation and added to the previous state to compute the update for the for the state. And this is how um, every point or every pixel in this map is being updated. It's taking the previous value and then it's adding some weighted uh, value of the innovation. That's the, how the Kalman filter tracks the mean and the Kalman filter also updates the, the uncertainty, so the covariance, and this is uh, using this formula here. Okay, let's uh, take a look at how it works uh, from a bigger point of view. Before we were looking at a pixel and this is representing the gradient map. So the magnitude is the radius and the direction is the color. And if we take a look at the portion of that map, then we can plot here like a grid of pixels and we are representing um, each Kalman filter with kind of the current state with an ellipse where the arrow says the, the gradient vector and the, so the mean and the uncertainty is the, is the size of the ellipse, the covariance. So remember that this is the, the whole map and if we blow it up and we zoom in, 
these are the pixels or the points on the map and for every pixel we have an extended Kalman filter whose values uh, for G and the covariance are updated depending on whether an event falls on that point on the map or not. So this is uh, a bit more in detail. At the iterations, imagine we are uh, looking at this pixel of the map. This is to remind us the equation that uh, there was, in this case, there is a negative event uh, or minus E. And uh, sorry, yeah. Well, okay. And then at the beginning, we have the um, initial value for the gradient and the covariance, which could be this one. And then we receive an event. And then we update the mean and the covariance. And we get another event. And we also update the mean and the covariance, and so on and so on. To we, with enough estimates, then hopefully we reduce the uncertainty and get a, a better estimate of, of this vector g. If we do this for a whole map, <clears throat> and then we would see something like this. And now imagine that we select some of the points, arbitrary random points on this map, <clears throat> and we plot uh, as time progresses, how is the evolution of the trace of the covariance of some points. So the trace of the covariance kind of indicates um, how, how much is the uncertainty in both directions, x and y. And this is in, in log scale, and you can see that uh, for some of the points, right, there are it, these points in the map, like a blue point on the map, for example, this one, it's visited multiple times as time passes because there are many events happening at that edge, and then uh, the uncertainty is decreasing. It means that the estimate is getting better and better. Okay, the second step is, uh, once we have computed this uh, gradient map, is how to obtain absolute intensity from it. And the idea is the following. You have, imagine you, you have already the gradient map and you can represent it in magnitude and direction or you can represent the X and Y components just like here. So there is an unknown scene that we don't, uh, of which we have the gradient in X and Y direction. What we do is that we compute the divergence, which is this quantity here, it's a scalar field. And then we solve Poisson's equation using this as a right-hand side. And the solution of the Poisson equation, in this case, we could use a fast solver using the fast Fourier transform, is a reconstructed image that looks very similar to the original image that gave rise to the gradients in x and y direction. So this equation here, it's a partial differential equation. This delta is not an increment, as we usually uh, use in the course is the Laplacian, so the Laplacian operator, it's a second order uh, differential operator. And basically, you, if you solve this partial differential equation using this uh, divergence as the driving force, the driving term, then you will get the reconstructed image. It looks like, I mean, maybe it's a bit more blurred, it's kind of doing a best fit in the L2 sense, but it's, it's a good approximation. Uh, let's take a look at the video. I've, if we were doing this and running some code to image reconstruction, on the top left you see the map of the events as they are being generated and referenced with respect to so the events on the image plane referenced on the map world. And uh, on the bottom left you see an example of the gradient in the x direction, how the trace of the covariance evolves and on the top right is the reconstructed image. So let's take a look again. So uh, we see that the events, the field of view of the camera is covering this part of the map as the camera is rotating. And as we rotate, we are filling new parts and refining old ones and being able to do a reconstruction of the intensity. So the result would be something like this. This is the gradient in the x direction. This is the gradient in the y direction. If we combine these two into magnitude and orientation, this is the result. Right? Do you use color to represent both in a single plot? And this is a reconstructed map in 
in log brightness. So before we take the exponential. And this is the trace of the covariance of, uh, of all the points in the map, all the pixels of this mosaic in, in log scale. And what it's interesting to see is that the, the more confident points are the ones that are darker here. So they have a small trace. And interesting is that those points precisely happen at the edges. Not surprisingly, because uh, events are triggered by edges as they move on the, on the image plane. And then if we do the same kind of plot, but using pseudo color, um, well, since motion here is mostly uh, panning around the Y camera axis, vertical edges are more confident than horizontal edges. You could see here, like this vertical edge is more confident than uh, horizontal edge. Yeah, and that's it for this uh, quite interesting algorithm. And we were mostly taking a look at the image reconstruction part.